yes, please. We are now at the doorstep of the third lecture of uh, minimum, sorry, medium rise building designs and constructions. Today, we will, uh, Professor will be explaining under the title, the design philosophy for a medium rise building of about 10 floors. Professor Jaisinger, we appreciate the steps taken forward to share your knowledge about this important area of civil engineering and shouldering the responsibilities as the chairman of the civil engineering sectional committee for the session 2021 20, and 22. Dear participants, hope you will explain what he delivers in this valuable lecture and throughout the series about designs and construction of medium and high rise buildings. As I mentioned last time, previous day, please remember that you need to register for each session through MIS, MIS since uh, this is a series of lectures. So enjoy the evening. Over to you, Professor, Professor Jai Singh. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Engineer Kamala. Can you all hear me? Oh, very well. Very well. Okay. Today I'm using the phone to for audio and uh, uh, computer for the video. So uh, I'll be doing the lecture again on uh, on uh, the screen on the whiteboard today as well because there are many things to be explained, which is easier to explain on the whiteboard by drawing rather than using a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So today again, I will take an example, which is similar to the example I used last time. So it's a building. Having a grids of 7.5 in this direction. No. No, okay. Now okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Fine. This way we'll have six meters each. This way. One, two, three, four, five, six, A, B, C, D, E. This is one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, in this, now this is a 10 story building. If it's a 10 story building, <clears throat> generally we are allocated about 25% of the area for the service core. So I'm planning to get lift arrangement like this. And I'll have a, another wall here, another wall here. So these are lifts. Now if it's a 10 story building, the first thing we have to see is whether the building can twist, whether the building can twist. So if you take wind in this direction, that is Y direction. We have this wall. Excuse me, professor. Excuse me. To resist wind. Yeah. Can I disturb you for a moment? Yeah, yeah. Someone yeah. that they can't hear. I don't know whether I can hear you well, but I can hear. I can hear. Some. Uh, some are not here. I think, but yeah, some some are there. No, they can't hear. Yeah, but they are. I think. I also can hear. I think. Okay. Right? Then I think. Uh, let them check their laptops or whatever again. Yeah, that's it. Yes. 
I think most of them are here, Mr. Pons, so we can continue. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So they can hear. So if you take this y direction, these walls are going to bend about an axis of because you know you can see the walls with this in this. This way or this way, depending on the direction of the wind. So if the axis of bending is like this, I'll put it this way. We have to see that the centroid of all these walls will lie along this axis. So what we do is we calculate x bar is equal to sigma i x divided by sigma i. Here. Second order of area. Mathematically arranged. So naturally the centroid should be on this, this axis. Similarly, when you take these walls, we like it to lie, the centroid lies somewhere here. So for these walls, the axis of bending will be like this. Axis of bending will be like this. So what we do is we take y bar is equal to sigma i y divided by sigma i. And when you take when you take that direction, you have to add this wall, this wall, and this wall. And let's say the distance of uh, the length of this wall is x one. Then you can calculate the length of that wall. Then you can calculate the length of that wall. And because it's a 10 story building, it's like that, you know, we can go for 225 or at 200 also possible, it's a little difficult to concrete. So if you go for 225 or 250 walls, then it's much easier to concrete. You lose only 50 millimeters or 25 millimeters, but still you'll find that the the, the concreting operation is very easy. So if you take this uh, structure, we'll have uh, walls, sorry, walls and columns. So if you take the length of this wall, that is six meters. So, we have a wall like this, six meters of length, bending about an axis like this, and then we have a column. Let's say we have selected the column size of 700 millimeter by 700 millimeter. Now, what can you say about 700 by 700 when it comes to earthquake resistance? Should be pretty okay, why? Last time we said that the beam depth will be only 600 by 600. The width can be about 300, 350 or 400. So the beam is smaller than the column. So we don't have to worry about where the plastic hinge forms because plastic hinge will always form within the beam, not in the column, which is a better way. So we don't have to worry too much about the, the plastic hinge formation. And so we select 700 by 700 millimeter for the column. Sometimes you might find you can manage this 600 by 600, but you might select 700 by 700 because we are not losing very much 
uh, we are not using a lot of space. If you look at this uh, grid size, it's six meters by 7.5 meters as we did last time. So you can select second division system. I'm not going to mark any second division system here because it will confuse, you know, it can add to some little bit of confusion. So you can select the slab system either without beams, second division or with second beams. It's all totally up to you. But the important point today we have to look is the column is wall is bending about an axis like that. Column is bending, beam is bending. So I value of is one twelfth into breadth 0.25 into six cube. And here I is one twelfth into point. 7 into 0.7 cubed. So what can you say about the I value of wall and I value of column? I wall is much, much, much bigger than I column. So if you look at the deflection of the structure, if it is a cantilever subjected to a dot W, the deflection at the top, delta, will be a function of W L to the power four divided by K times EI. K you can find from a textbook. So if you if you're using this equation, if I is very big in the wall, IW is very big, what can I say about the delta value? Delta will be very small. Delta will be very small. And then you say delta is so small, delta is so small that we say delta is equal to almost zero. Because it's only 10 story building. Delta is approximately equal to zero. So you can, there's no lateral deformation. We are going, we, we will have about 10, 15 millimeter deflection because it's a 40 meter tall building deflecting 10 millimeter, very small. So we say, Building is not deflecting. Building is not moving. So if the building is not moving, why? Wall is not allowing it to move. Then we say all the lateral loads, all these W, will be carried by walls. And the frame carry only the, only the vertical load. Frames will carry only the vertical loads. Now we have simplified the design. Now we have simplified the design to a great extent. Because now all the vertical loads will be carried by the frames. Basically, steps will transfer the loads onto the beams and beams will transfer the loads onto the columns. So frames are carrying the vertical loads. Walls also can carry vertical loads, but, but when it comes to lateral loads, almost all the lateral loads are carried by the walls. So we'll find the wall is carrying a load N and a lateral load W, which causes a bending moment M. So the wall will be carrying a bending moment M and an uh, axial load N. So we can do the design first by designing the frame and then designing the wall. On the other hand, we can design the building by designing the frame first and then designing the wall. So either way, we will get the same answer because now we are divided the problem. The problem is all the lateral loads are carried by the walls. All the vertical loads are carried by the frames. And if there's a wall instead of a column, then wall also can carry some vertical loads. Anyway, there will be the self weight of the wall. Self weight of the wall is carried by the wall. So, so wall will have axial load plus any other load transferred onto the wall. So that is the situation. So let's see how to design the wall first. 
and it will take y direction. You take y direction. You take y direction. Then we have the second model area is three times i. I is this value. I w is this value. Three times I w. Why three times I w? Because we have this wall, this wall, and this wall. There are three walls. There are three walls, and a total load of w acting at each, acting as a UDL along the height of the building. So we have to see how to design the wall. So what we can do is, because the load is W, we can straight away say M is equal to, if the height of the wall is H, height is H, M is equal to WH divided by H by two, or WH squared divided by two. Delta times H is the total load, H by two is the distance of the centroid. So the total moment will be W H squared divided by two. And the moment carried by each wall will be this divided by three. So M by each wall one will be W H squared divided by six. So we have, we have three walls. So each wall will carry W H squared divided by six. W S squared divided by six, and we have to determine this 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 uh, moment at ultimate limit state. So when you are using uh, euro codes, the W is multiplied by one point five. W is multiplied by one point five, considering it's a variable action. Consider that it is a variable action. Consider that it is a variable action. And in another lecture, I'll show you how to get all these different combinations. Today, we'll not worry too much about it because it's a, it's a lecture on its own, right? So we'll see how the combinations can be formed. But today, we we'll simply consider that bin load will be, in load will be multiplied by 1.5. Then we have the dead loads. That is in self-weight. So we multiply it by 1.35. And we can have the wind load acting simultaneously. So we multiply sim uh, the impulse load by 0.7 according to the Euro code, multiplied by QK. So it gives a reduction factor. Because total wind load and total live load cannot act together. So we have the dominant action and the secondary action. Now, in this case, second, dominant action is the wind. And oh, so we, have, we get 1.5 times wind. <laughs> and we also have <laughs> secondary action. And <laughs> impulse load, so we get 0.7 times 1.5. For the dead load, we always get 1.35. Which means now we know the value of n, we know the value of m. So if you know the value of n and m, the important question is how do we find the reinforcement? How do you find the reinforcement? This is a wall. This is a wall. We know the overall moment, we know the overall axial load. And how do you find the reinforcement? Now I'm going to erase the board. So if you want, if you want little time to take down notes, please tell me. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, I'm going to erase it. Because I want to, I want little space to show you how the Reinforcement can be can be calculated. So we have a win, uh, combination one point three five dk plus point seven five times one point five. 
QK and the wind load is multiplied by 1.5 because wind load is dominant now. But we can have another load combination where the impulse load is dominant, wind load is 0.5 times 1.5, 50% of wind load plus full live load. It's also possible. So I'm going to erase this all. Because we know the wind, the, all the loads, now you can calculate the, you can have numerical values. Then we have a shear wall, which is six meters of length, which is bending about an axis like this. Always you can use right hand corkscrew rule to find how the, how the walls bend, about which axis the walls bend. And then this length is six meters. Now you, to, you can make another assumption. That is, you know, this is a long wall, tall wall, 40 meters of height, six meters of length. Then we assume that this is going to behave as a column. Going to behave as a column. And what we can do is we can find you can make use of the column interaction chart, NOBH, MOBH squared, and we get charts like this, 0.4%, 1%, 2%, and so on. So what we do is we select a certain area, something like 0.5 meters for concentrating all our reinforcement. At the edges, ends, we consider a length of 0.5 meters. So the effective depth will be this height, D, will be D will be 6.0 minus 0.25 meters. And then you can find the DOH ratio, which will come close to 0.9. So based on that, you can you have to select the column interaction chart. So there are column interaction charts for different values of DOH, but in a long wall, it's most likely to be close to 0.9. So based on this, we calculate NOBH, MOBH squared, and then we select a point on the appropriate column interaction chart. And then we say, we are going to write that amount of reinforcement. And where do you have to write that amount of reinforcement? That is at the bottom, that is at the bottom. So if you want to reduce the reinforcement, we can do the tall wall, 40 meters tall, you can select different sections and calculate N and M at each level. And then based on that, you can reduce the reinforcement. Based on that, you can reduce the reinforcement. So let's say we find that we need 0.4% reinforcement. Let's say we find that we want 0.4% reinforcement. 0.4% reinforcement. So we say 100 is over BH is equal to 0.4% or 0.4. And then from that, you can calculate AS. And then what we do is we provide half of AS here. This AS divided by two. The remaining half here, like, like what we do in a column. So we concentrate the reinforcement at the ends, and we 
Right, half the reinforcement we calculate here at the corners. Then you are asked, what are we going to do for the rest? For the rest, we are going to provide the Eurocode says provide 0.2 percent reinforcement. 0.2 percent reinforcement, the vertical direction. Whereas the British code earlier used to say provide 0.4 percent reinforcement. Sometimes you find that 0.2% reinforcement is too light. So generally in Sri Lanka, I think in the Sri Lanka national election also, we provide 0.4% reinforcement as the minimum. So we can provide 0.4% reinforcement as the minimum, 0.2% on each face vertically. And horizontally, we can provide 0.25% reinforcement on both faces. Both phases 0.25% reinforcement horizontally. Now you can see the middle part, the reinforcement is already provided using the minimum rule. And at the ends, the reinforcement is provided by considering that we behaves as a column. So now we have provided the reinforcement in vertical direction and horizontal direction. Now the design of the wall is over at the ground level. We can repeat the calculation at any level you want. And you can reduce the amount of reinforcement needed as you go up. As you go up. So this way, we can easily find the reinforcement in the wall by making an assumption that the wall is going to behave as a column. Wall is going to be as a column. Any questions on this? So there is one question in the chat box. Yeah. What is the question? Do we need a con do we need to consider? Uh, notional load or imperfection load with the wind load? Yes, always you have to consider a notional load. A notional load is given in the in the Euro code as well. In the British code, it is 0.15% 0 .0, 0 of the uh, dead load that we call 0 0.0015. 0 0.15% of the dead load. But in the record also, a similar rule is given. Similar rule is given. So you have to use that rule and calculate the value. The values come closer and always consider a notional load. That is correct. You have to consider the minimum as the minimum of max, the value uh, maximum of notional load or the wind load. Well, whichever is higher, you will use it. But notional load, you don't multiply it by a factor. Notional load is whatever the value you get from the calculation, but you don't have to multiply it by a factor. Whereas uh, wind load, you have to. So you have to, you, you, it's, it's better if you consider notional load and wind load all together. So, so the computer program, uh, computer package, if you are using a computer package, it will automatically select which one is more critical. Otherwise you have to look at the load magnitudes and decide which one is more critical. Uh, it's true that wind load, notional load should be used. Can we, uh, can we, uh, yeah, can't we consider the uh, combined second moment of inertia of the wall, uh, wall, uh, core wall? Because here you consider only the major direction, uh, minor direction you didn't consider. So, can we consider the combined? Uh, but but but, but uh, the, the, if you consider, if you consider the if you consider the the, the way that it's twisting. It is easier to consider only the major direction, the walls in the major direction only. Because, you know, it's a 10-story building. And uh, the, the walls in the other direction will contribute very little unless the building is twisting. If the building is twisting, the walls in the other direction can make a significant contribution. 
Otherwise, you know, when you consider the length of the wall, the dominant dominant behavior will be due to the length of the wall. So generally, if I mean, the, what you have to see is, you know, how much accuracy you need for the calculations. And the gain you get, the gain will be very little, and you will be just unnecessarily wasting your time on doing very serious calculations. So that's why you know it's important that we uh, we can go when you are doing manual calculations. Generally, we do not consider the balls in the other direction. We consider the balls only in the dominant direction, and then do the manual calculations. So this is a manual calculation. On the other hand, if you want to get a more accurate result, you can make a 3D model for the tensorial bit, and then automatically the model will look take account of the the presence of core boxes. So what, what we call is, you know, these are called core boxes. It's a core, which is acting like a box. So automatically the computer program will consider the effect that there's a core box. But when you are doing manual calculations, there is no need. And the, the, the error that you get in the answer is very minute. So there's no point in wasting our time trying to do very accurate calculations when you consider that design itself is a very approximate process. Why do I say it's a very approximate process? The only thing that I, that I can assess with a reasonable degree of accuracy is the self weight. Can I estimate the impulse loads? No, I cannot. So I make a guess. Can I calculate the wind loads? Again, the answer is no. So we make a guess based on some guideline given in a code. So if you are guessing so many things, then we, we include the partial factor of safety to look into the uncertainty of these things that we have guessed. That's why we have a higher factor. So when so many things are approximate, what is the point in being very accurate with the sheer wall calculations? No point. So always you have to look at how much accuracy we need in design. And if you think by being a little more accurate, you are not going to save anything, don't, don't, don't do those calculations. They are useless calculations. Do a simple model where you will understand the exact behavior. And then if you want a very accurate result, allow it to a three-dimensional computer program like ETAPS. Because ETAPS is written for buildings and it can take account of all these So basically, uh, you have to look at the lecture Less than five stories, no shear wall, one. Up to 10 floors, another method. When I go, but again, you use a simple model. Like a 2D model, converting the everything to a 2D model. Whereas when I'm going for a 20 story or more, now it's time to be a little more accurate. And for those things, we will do a 3D model on computer. And it is not a waste of time. It's a, it's a worthwhile exercise. But trying to do a 3D model for a 10-story building, knowing very well that the deflections are going to be so small, interactions are going to be so small, you'll be just wasting your time. I, I, I'll consider, yeah, I will consider the foundation design much more, much more seriously than the design of the superstructure because finally, all these loads should be transferred to the foundation. Now we have a big problem. Problem is, do we know, do we need a pile foundation or a rough foundation? That is a big question. Because sometimes pile foundation, this might have only few call, few piles, but it might cause a lot of money because it pile foundation means a lot of mobilization, a lot of mobilization. So. We might have to consider a rough foundation, although it's a 10-story building. 
So if you have right right partitions, there's a good chance that a rough foundation may be possible, but you might have to consider a weight compensated raft where the raft is actually the building will have one or two basements and then the bottom slab of the basements will act like a the bottom slab of the basement will act like a raft. Otherwise, you will find that the soil strength is not sufficient. So you may need one or one and a half, uh, one, one basement plus uh, one semi basement type of situation, provided the water level is sufficiently low. Provided the water level is sufficiently low, you might go for that kind of solution. So one of the assumptions that we make in this model is the shear walls are connected to the foundation and the rotation at this level is almost zero. At the floor level is almost zero. And assuring that with the foundation design will be a bigger responsibility than considering the, trying to be very accurate with the superstructure modeling because it is not going to do much in this particular structure. The reason is there are plenty of shear walls and the reflections are very small. So all the things will be dominated by the, uh, the behavior of the shear wall, where the shear wall deflection will be very, very small, like uh, five to 10 millimeter, which can again be ignored. And the frame will be designed separately. Frame will be designed separately. Have I answered your question? Yes, can I get some feedback? Uh, have I answered the question or you have any other question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. Any yes, other sir, question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in a wall, uh, so you have designed uh, as a column. So in a column, yeah. so we uh, do restraining of alternative bars, uh, which are uh, 150 millimeter away from a restrained vertical bar. Do we apply that uh, same concept for this wall reinforcement? No, wall reinforcement, that concept will be well if, that, uh, if the amount of reinforcement in that particular area is more than 2%. So, so we calculate this concentrated reinforcement, then calculate the amount of reinforcement in this particular area. If it is more than 2%, then you have to ensure that you detail it exactly as a column. Like exactly as a column. But in my case, now, you know, I know for sure the first floor and the second floor. These areas will be heavily, heavily stressed. So when I'm detailing for about two floors, I might consider a reinforcement arrangement like this. So I'll be confining these edges to us as why in case of an earthquake where which 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 part of the wall will get the maximum effect the bottom part will get the maximum effect and again in the even in the bottom part the ends will get maximum effect so no harm in having highest higher confinement to have higher confinement about two floors or three floors, you can have additional restraints, right? And anyway, because it's it is it has been designed as a column. No harm in providing this concentrated reinforcement, uh, the kind of confining reinforcement or the full height, because in case of an unknown, unforeseen situation, some of the reinforcement might be mobilized, might be mobilized. Otherwise, theoretically, you don't need. What you need is only the space of bus, where, which means for every uh, 0.4 meters or so, you'll have a bar connecting the two mats of reinforcement. You'll have additional bar connecting two mats of reinforcement. That's all you need. But uh, because uh, you, know, you need only a few links, 
like this i mean it, it's not going to cost us much money but when it comes to the safety enhancement the benefits are very high because of that you might consider it's worth providing the the edge restraining reinforcement over the full height of the building over the full height of the building have i answered the question yes sir thank you yeah, okay any any yes. other question yes yeah, one more question uh, one more question uh, so here you are assuming that the geometric center and the stiffness center is same so due to the same. architectural Basically, arrangement no 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 i am not assuming I, i have selected the walls in such a way that it becomes that way yeah yeah uh, due to the architectural arrangement if we can't make it uh, coincide uh, is it okay is it recommended to design with a twisting mode no it is okay if it's a small building it's okay to design it as a as a uh, in the twisting mode but uh, if it is about 10 story building and you you cannot do anything it's okay but when you are going beyond 20 floors 10 floors you have to keep in mind the stuff belongs to the structure ring <coughs> so one way the other you will do calculation and tell the architect i want some extra walls because i want to balance the building i don't like a twisty building but if it is a small building seven story to 10 story type and architect is adamant that he cannot give anything you want one way the other finish the structure then what i do is i will go for a box why the box i connect this with a big beam big beam and i'll put some beams here and i'll make it very stiff box what will happen now it's a very stiff beam box even if twists it can it can take the twisting very well it can take the twisting very well so because of that reason if the architect is adamant and he he doesn't understand the basic fundamentals but still you want to work with the architect take some precautions but don't compromise if the structure is more than 10 floors you must be the in charge of the structure architect is in front in charge of the facade architect is in in, in charge of the facade because he he makes it beautiful whereas when it comes to the structure architect should ask the structural engineer what do you want and then based on that only the architect should uh, do the planning or the architect can do the planning with a flexible mind that you know structural engineer ask for something extra because billy is twisting the architect should be willing to uh, give that option otherwise is too dangerous there are buildings where the problems are persistent because engineer has given to the request by the architect that is not the way when the building is told structure belongs to us facade belongs to the architect so you have to keep that in mind and don't for don't give in too much because you might end up with a bad building and when the bad building develops a bad reputation who will lose uh, the reputation you will lose the reputation so it's not worth so you will insist that you know that uh, the building is uh, you are allowed to balance the building you are allowed to balance the building so that the building is not twisting on the other hand what you do is then you will make a 3d model of the building and show the architect this is how you this building is going to behave and do you like that kind of twisting behavior the the chances are architect might back down and say okay i'll you do you select the structure i'll i'll do the architectural part or the facade around the structure rather than i'm trying to dictate where the structure members come the architect cannot decide where the structure members will come it has to be designed by the the decided by the structure engineer then a general arrangement drawing is drawn the architect can approve the locations uh, and ensure that the 
the strong elements that you have selected will not coincide with the the vision of the architect so so you can the architect can work with the structure and engineer in harmony so always you have to uh, otherwise you will tell the architect what's going to happen and even if he can't understand mathematics don't use too much mathematics but uh, show, tell the architect how the structure is going to behave and how why it's twisting and so on then he might actually he might uh, help you to uh, come up with the but is that clear if nothing can be done i'll make some of these super strong super strong so that even if the wheel twists it twists very little so that nobody will feel that it's twisting is that clear yeah uh, thank you sir thank you so design of wall is very very simple now we have to design the design the frames for vertical loads uh, shall i move to design of frames with the vertical with, with the vertical loads yes sir yes yeah. sir can i sir, can i ask yeah any other questions uh, sir uh, then from where we can find this uh, column interaction uh, curves uh, should we have uh, uh, another set of curves Uh, which are Actually, not uh, there is a structural engineers uh, the institution of structural engineers has issued a manual and in that manual you can find all the interaction curves for europe and uh, you, uh, the, the, there are other interaction curves they you freely downloadable from internet you can download it on the internet the uh, interaction charts are available on internet you can download it thank you sir uh, okay. another one but, yeah, but, but yeah, the, the, those interaction charts uh, will have if see you the so f f c k term also right but it doesn't matter they, they all they are all the same because uh, rather than developing different charts for different concrete strength they have developed one chart up to 50 megapascal concrete any other question there are a few uh, i will read out i, I think uh... yes please yeah Uh, how do we select the depth of the wall sections of the two ends one question the one uh -huh. uh, do we need to consider slenderness in this wall designs when designing as column a uh, good question yes so basically it's a little bit of judgment because you know you don't like too small and too big so if it is 6 meters you can you might consider even 0.75 meter or 0.8 meter ends Rather than point five meters, so it's totally up to you. Because when the column is behaving, the it will go into a plastic behavior, not the elastic behavior. So in the plastic behavior, what matters is uh, where the where the where the main reinforcement are. So it is not an elastic behavior. The at the failure load the wall will have a plastic behavior so it's a cracked wall, wall because the wall is cracked what you need is a concentration of reinforcement at the ends so it is so purely arbitrary so you might you might design the same wall with 0.8 meter and another person might design it for 0.7 meter i would say 0.5 meter is the about bare minimum you, I, I, even i would i would i would consider something like 0.7 or 0.8 meter but you will not consider 2 meters because too much 2 meters is too much so anything up to 1 meter is okay any any up to 1 meter is okay but i would prefer something like 0.8 meters because it's only a small building 10 10 floors only and the walls are 6 meters of uh, length so because of that reason i might consider something like 0.8 meter or even 1 meter is okay that is first question second question is how about the wall buckling but if you consider this building it's a brace building in a brace building the effective height is about 0.85 times the clear height and when you consider that you'll find that 
the walls are all behaving as short walls because you can go up to a ratio of Aren't here, I think, Professor. Professor, unmute your phone. Can't hear. So we can't hear you, sir. Professor, we can't hear you. I think he, he even don't hear us. Yeah, yeah. Madam Kamala, can you tell me? Unmute your phone. Uh, Are you muted now? No, no. I think he has logged off from the phone. Left from the meeting from his phone. Recording in progress. Professor, last five minutes we couldn't hear you. The point we talked about the slenderness, we didn't, we didn't hear. Again, he's muted. Again, his phone is muted. Uh. No. Yeah, yeah, you can hear me, right? You can hear. Yeah. Now can, but yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, because there's a small problem. Uh, I have been disconnected by the phone. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I will draw this. Now the frame. Excuse me, the frame. So, one of these frames. So, what we do is we select a simplified subframe and it. So, I'm going to 
Baker syndrome is framed by adding fixity at these locations. So this right subframe will look like this. It look like this. So I can go for pattern loading. That means uh, in uh, Eurocode, we consider all the spans are loaded by 1.35 GK for dead loads. All the spans are loaded. But when it comes to the, the live load, we can say, here we get the live load, here we get the live load, and so on. So Eurocode actually specifies one thing, the rational ratio of UK specifies the ordinate to uh, the, the, the ordinate to spans loaded maximum. So in uh, Sri Lanka national ratio, so we have gone along with the UK pattern, UK method. So we can still use uh, the all the spans loaded full or ordinate spans loaded with maximum and others are not loaded. That can be uh, decided. So how do we analyze this? Easiest thing is to analyze it using a simple software like SAP 2000. So you can make a model of this subframe on, uh, on SAP 2000. And then the most important thing is, here you have to make sure Rather than fixity, it is like a joint like this. That means this particular joint can't move, but it can move vertically. It can move vertically. It's important that you assign a joint like that. Don't assign a fixed joint. Assigning a fixed joint means the column is fixed. It's hanging from the sky, which is wrong. So always you have to make sure the column joint at the top will be a moving joint, not a fixed joint, not a fixed joint. It's important. Always allocate a moving joint in the vertical direction. But what happens is all this will show. And if this point is fixed, then the frame will start hanging from the top of the column, which is wrong. This is not going to happen. So you have to introduce a joint like this. So you'll create pattern loading, use SAP 2000, create bending moment envelope, and do the calculation. Again, when you are creating the bending moment envelope, you can consider moment redistribution, redistribution of moments. So how that happens is you will make sure that, what if you get a bending moment diagram like this, you can say only 80% of the moment will act here. So that means you change. The origin of the line, bending moment diagram, You can't hear again, sir. Can't hear again. Professor, can't he hear again? We can't hear, sir.
Excuse me, Professor. They can't hear. His connection is not there. He is not there. Connection is there, but the phone is not there. Ah, that's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah, his phone is gone. Phone is gone. Yeah, screen is there, but the, his voice connection connected is gone. How can you express? Uh, I have to inform the sir only. I'm again getting a small problem with the. Ah, now it's okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now through the uh, computer? Yeah, now it's clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Today is a dialogue from. The phone is disconnecting. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't Recording and talking. No, no, sorry, sorry about that trouble. Again, uh, there was a small technical problem. I have been disconnected due to not sure which is the problem. I think you have not heard uh, the part on moment redistribution. Uh, from that uh, menu moment diagram, you can repeat again. Rosa. Yeah, okay, right, okay. So what happens is, courts allow up to about 20, 20, 30 percent redistribution, but generally I don't, I would not do more than 20 percent of 20 percent redistribution. So redistribution means we are reducing the bending moment or the support, and then allowing it to be compensated by increasing the bending moment. In So basically what you do is you calculate 80% from the top and mark a point and get the baseline acting at acting through that point. So that way you can very easily use a graphical method and calculate the value of the venue moment relevant for your calculations. So rather than doing any uh, numerical calculation, you just use graphics and do the select the values. That's very easy. So the whole idea of moment distribution is the beams cannot collapse by forming plastic hinges because beams are supported by the column. So at the, sub at the support, there's no point in designing for the full moment you can design for about 80% of the moment where the remaining part of the moment is now taken by the span sections. So you can see the span sections will now be designed for a higher moment than earlier. But span sections are very efficient in carrying moment because they behave as flange beams. So because of that reason, there's no harm in transferring uh, part of the moment at the support to the span. So basically, you will go for pattern loading, generate bending moment diagram, and then find the critical moment diagrams, and then you can reduce the moments in critical moment diagram. The most critical moment diagram will be all spans loaded with maximum. And once you select that, you can reduce it by about 20%. So you can do moment distribution once you get 
depending on the values. And generally, uh, where, where do you get a failure in a beam? You never get a failure here because it's supported. Always you get the failure here. So when you calculate the reinforcement, will you write exactly the answer or you, will you provide a little more reinforcement in the span sections? I would always provide a little more reinforcement in the span sections because nothing can go wrong when you provide a little extra reinforcement in the span sections. The reason is any failure in the beam will occur in the Span sections. So I would like to have a slightly higher factor of safety where the failure can occur. And I will go for a lower factor of safety at the places where the failures cannot occur. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, from yes, the, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, so this is this is you know. Not a normal design where, you know, these are design where you like to assess the risk and take some extra precautions that are not given in the code, that are not given in the code. So you take some extra precautions that are not given in the code. And that extra precaution is you will over design the span section slightly, whereas you will do moment distribution to a reasonable level over the support. That is, that is always there. But codes do not say assess the risk, and if they if you anticipate any higher risk, then provide some extra precaution. That part is missing in the codes. But when I design, I always consider anywhere, any place where the failures can occur, I will take on my own accord. I will take few precautions, like uh, using higher higher level of reinforcement, slightly higher level of reinforcement. Is that clear? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, that uh, if we consider that earthquake load, so yeah. if we uh, redistribute the movement at uh, Columbine Junction, so then the reinforcement density reduces, then that yes. uh, plastic hinge can be occurred at the Columbine Junction due to that earthquake load? No, no, actually, uh, the, the column section is bigger than the beam. Always uh, the plastic hinge will. Professor, we can't hear you. Cannot hear. Uh, earthquake. Is that right? Uh, professor couldn't hear for some time now. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there was a question on earthquakes. Huh. And uh, what will happen when you do the redistribution in case of an earthquake? So what happens is, with redistribution, we are reducing the bending moment at the support, and the bending moment in the beam is reduced. by about 20%. Then the question is, what will happen in an earthquake? In an earthquake, still the hinge will form in the beam because beam is a smaller cross section than a column. I deliberately to still the, the plastic hinge will form in the beam. So, to have satisfactory behavior with respect to the plastic hinge, what is important is the confinement provided by the links, not the longitudinal reinforcement. So by reducing the longitudinal reinforcement or the support, you are not going to reduce the earthquake resistance. The earthquake resistance is confinement that you have provided at the support. So if you have provided reinforcement at about 75 millimeter centers, that is a rule I always use. For about 0.6 meters, I use reinforcement, T8 reinforcement at 75 millimeters. Automatically, you will find the confinement is high. Because the confinement is high, the behavior of the building where the redistribution has been undertaken and no redistribution has been done, both will be the same. The reason is it's not going to uh the 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 land is not going to govern anything it's a it's a transfer so because of that reason i generally have a rule the rule is i would like to have for about 0.6 meters i like to have t8 bars at uh, 75 millimeter centers so that means a lot of t8 bars a lot of confinement then the earthquake resistance will be there. Have I answered the question? Yes, sir. excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, code has a limitation of redistribution amount. Uh, if, the, yeah. if the frames provide lateral stability, then the code, yeah. code says the minimum, maximum amount is 10%. That is, that is unbraced. The frame providing lateral stability means it's an unbraced structure. But here it's a braced structure. Because we are having shear walls, it's a brace structure. If it's unbraced 10%, it's if it is braced, you can go for up to about 30%. But generally, I would like to stay somewhere around 20%. Is that clear? Uh, clear, sir. And another thing, sir, when we do the, yeah. when we design for the span, are we going to consider a flange section to design a span? Or oh, if we use rectangular section design, it still we need, need to provide additional reinforcement. No, I mean I would I would always go with a flange beam design for the span because it's very economical. I will not do design the span section as a rectangular section because it's going to behave as a flange beam. I will always design it as a flange beam. Is that clear? Clear, sir. Clear. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. So, any other specific question? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, sir. Sorry? Uh, sir, uh, when uh, the beam has a different section, that means one beam, one continuous beam has uh, different sections. Yes. Uh, the, is, it, uh, is it good or, uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, if, if there's a different section due to the architect purpose, uh, um, Doing moment redistribution is uh, uh, good. Actually, even if you have different section, uh, if you want, because when you are calculating the 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 bending moment values, already uh, this uh, variable section is taken into account. Organized by the computer with different beam sizes. So even if there's a different beam sizes, there's no harm in doing a moment distribution. 
but uh, i might stay somewhere around 15% rather than going for something at 20 or 25% i might stay somewhere around 15% because uh, now uh, the the structure itself is not very consistent you know we have in different 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 sections so 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 there may be anchoring problems and all that we really don't know how you are going to detail it so better to keep the moment resolution at a certain level so that uh, the not too much moment is transferred to the span sections but you can certainly do the moment resolution it does not matter because when you are doing the venue moment uh, analysis or automatically the computer program will take into account the different sizes of the beams it's not a problem is that clear uh, yes sir thank you sir another one sir yeah. then uh, in in this in, within the span uh, if the section is changing uh, will it cause any local failure that mean uh, not a trapezoidal change it's a sudden change what do you mean by that uh, within the section in, within, within a span, span you are having different sections uh, that mean uh, uh, rather than rather than changing the uh, section is changing uh, within the column it's changing at the middle middle of the span ah so you some architectural reason you are having two two different sections yes is it in that is case, it, uh, case when you are, when, uh, no in that case when you are modeling you will model it as a smaller b when you are modeling you will do the modeling as if the whole beam is a smaller beam not the bigger beam is that clear sir thank you okay right sir excuse me sir yeah. uh, so yes. should we design our uh, shear walls as brace one or unbrace one no because you are having shear walls in two different directions x and y all the shear walls will now be braced but if you have shear walls only in one direction then then you are asking for trouble i will ensure that always i i will brace the building in both directions right is that thank clear you, thank you yeah. sir and the yeah. one said now this beams are a little deeper and wide and when when they connected uh, when they are connected to this uh, uh, 200 mm or 225 Uh, millimeter thick uh, shear walls is mm. there any problems with the uh, overall behavior the slabs, I mean, the, so when you are uh, connecting the slabs to the wall i mean sir beams uh, to the wall cylinder wall a beam to the wall beam to yeah. the wall uh, at some sub places instead of the column you are having the wall that is your question is that right uh, so wall thickness is uh, uh, smaller than the beam width Yeah, so it is a matter of... because 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 uh, the, if you can provide enough bearing, uh, in the in the case of wall, uh, now we can see if you take here, now there are walls in both directions, so there it will not be a big problem. But if you have if you don't have the wall in the other direction, then you have to be really careful in detailing. Generally, we don't consider because you know wall is a very strong element. so if you connect the beam reinforcement and send the beam reinforcement into the wall there's very little chance for it to fail so because of that reason we will not really worry too much about this connection because we consider it's a proper connection the the it the re, the, uh, the answer comes from the fact that we are going to uh, you know uh, provide uh, sufficient reinforcement in the beam so that it will, it will, it can be properly connected to the wall so because of that reason i don't anticipate any problem there is that clear yes sir thank you thank you very much so make sure the beam reinforcement continue into the wall that is the important point so excuse me yeah uh, sir so sometimes uh, uh, actually uh, i want to know whether it is necessary to go for uh, higher stiffness uh, uh, beam than column uh, always because sometimes we have to select uh, the dimensions of the beam uh, compared to the column uh, having lesser uh, uh, having yeah, some yeah, higher actually, stiffness actually, than column uh, yeah. actually actually what you have to make sure is column is larger than the beam not vice versa 
So, so you select the size of the beam. And last time I explained how to select the size of the beam. I said, you know, under different situations, uh, you know, even for a higher spans, we use uh, uh, say 600 millimeter overall depth. And then uh, if you have any problem in the other direction, uh, then, then you can actually uh, select a suitable beam size. So basically the whole idea is ensure the column is bigger than the beam. Column is bigger than the beam, not vice versa. Okay. Okay, so thank right. you. Uh, another question. Then, then, then you can confine the failure of, to the beam. Plasting occurs in the beam, and beam is okay because beam has a high, higher capacity in the span section, so it's okay to have uh, the plastic hinge forming in the beam. Yeah. But if the plastic hinge forms in the column, the column can start uh, moving and losing the stability. Yeah, exactly. So yes. Like a yeah. bigger column and a smaller beam. Yeah. Now we are approaching yeah. eight thirty, and if you have, I think we can take only about one or two questions more. So basically, uh, once you know the bending moments and shear forces, you can destroy the reinforcement in the frames and the columns. Uh, you know, from this uh, uh, frame analysis, you know, column over column loads can, be, you know, the column load transferred onto the uh, the the. The load transfer of the column at each flow can be determined by using the subframe. And based on that, you know, you can do a quick manual calculation and find the load on the, the maximum load on the at the base base level. Yeah. Because you know, you can always find the load that is transferred onto a column by the beams when you do the subframe analysis. So based on that, you can make a estimate of the column load. So otherwise, you can go for the tributary area and do the calculation. You can yeah. go for the tributary area and do the calculation. So the tributary area and do the calculation. That is yeah. also possible. Yeah. yeah OK, so thank you, sir. Uh, another question, uh, yeah. sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes uh, when, we, uh, the, when we change the uh, redistribution level, and the point of counterflexure uh, uh, get changes. Uh, how can uh, how can get some idea? No, no, it's, it's, it's a, a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a only a generally it's a, only a minute minute change. Uh -huh. So so Eurocode gives a lot of guidelines on those things. So basically, uh, I mean, what you have to say is uh, why we why we dis why we don't want to continue too many reinforcement across the column is we have congestion of reinforcement, <laughs> right? Yeah. So 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 if you think the point of counterflexure is changing, you can actually yeah. make it uh, make it uh, make the what uh, the cutoff points. You can adjust the cutoff points, reinforcement yeah. cutoff points. So, yeah. so in such situations, uh, I would rather, uh, rather than trying to do a lot of accurate calculations, I would rather use a, a simple rule. Hmm. Uh, one rule I generally use is uh, I will make sure that all the bottom reinforcement continues up to about point three, within 0.3 meters of uh, the support. Within 0.3 meters of the support, then all these uh, uh, minute problems will be looked after. Did you yeah. get the point? I mean, I'll yeah, 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 yeah. ensure because yeah, we, are, we are not saving a lot of steel by, uh, you know, by trying to find the, uh, by finding the exact cutoff point. We are not saving yeah. a lot of steel. Yeah, OK. OK, so yeah. the reason for asking that question is we don't know how can it affect to the service criteria. No, basically, uh, no. if you if you if you continue the reinforcement, then then there's no way you can, the service criteria. Is that clear? I mean, what you do is us when you are currently in the reinforcement, but on reinforcement, but no yeah. need to be uh, uh, generous when you are currently in the top reinforcement. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So basically, in the beam, uh, I would be a little generous with the bottom. Yeah. Because any any failure in bottom reinforcement, it'll end up with a crack. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's yeah. why I said, uh, you know, we I like to do a risk-based risk analysis. 
risk risk based analysis not just analysis i will not believe in the research but i will look at how the structure behave where things can go wrong at places where things can go wrong i'll take i'll put some additional reinforcement and ensure those places will never ever fail that's my philosophy okay sir okay okay sir thank you thank you very much sir Professor, yeah, 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 Professor, there was a recent situation from Sakuni for some yeah. time. So shall we ask her to ask her? Yeah, question? yeah, of course, of course, yes. Uh, it's okay. okay. I, it's okay because I we didn't hear. That's why I just raised hand. Someone test. All right, right. Okay. Ah, okay. Now it's okay. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> Then uh, shall shall we wind up? Uh, because I have I, covered I almost so everything. Great. I mean, I have showed you that it can be done easily. Once you understand how it behaves, it can be done. But but this philosophy will not be applicable for fifteen twenty fifteen to twenty story buildings. So next day we will think how to deal with fifteen to twenty story buildings, right? But what you have to keep in mind is, you know, if you want, you can do a computer model for all these structures and do the get the answers. But sometimes you know, when it's a small building, people ask questions suddenly. Then you can do a quick set of calculations like this and come up with answers, right? But uh, otherwise, you know, always go for a 3D model and do the analysis. But uh, uh, it's 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 worth knowing how to deal with a small building, a small base building, uh, so that you know you can uh, even when you don't have a computer, or you want you don't have access, or you are in a hurry, you can always beat the computer by doing calculations like this. But after that, you know, once you sort sort the problem out, you can go for a computer model and do the proper calculations. But the important thing is to under understand how the structures behave. So, with that, shall we conclude? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, is it necessary to continue beams through the shear walls, or can we stop at the end of the? Shear wall. No, no need. No need to continue, but 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 you have to provide sufficient anchorage into the shear wall. As a fixed joint. To to ensure that the the joint behaves properly. Otherwise, okay, otherwise it will become a simply supported pin joint. If you don't provide the reinforcement properly, thank and then you, it will sir. transfer higher bending moment to the to the span. Excuse me, sir. One last question. Thank Shall you, sir. Yes. Uh, So, uh, do we need to uh, the bottom line of uh, strong column weak beam uh, can, uh, can condition is uh, whether we uh, the stiffness of the beam and the column, I/O yes. L ratio, or yes. every time do we have to consider the larger column and the uh, uh, yeah the, the, basically the, the basically columns will not form hinges because column has a bigger section in compression. So because of that. Uh, Columns. Uh, if the column is large, uh, always the hinge will be in the B. Columns will not uh, form hinges because most of the area of the column is in compression. So always uh, the hinge will form in the B, not in the column. So have I answered your question? Uh, I have one doubt. The, if, yeah. if the column has a higher I O L ratio and the B mm -hmm. has less I O L ratio. Do we need to consider the IOL ratio or the dimensions? No, it is the dimension. It is the dimension because because you know column. You have to. That's why I said column. Although column is longer, the IOL ratio is different. But still, when you consider reinforced concrete, beam concrete is cracked. Column concrete is almost uncracked. Because most of the column is in compression, column concrete, column uh, rain, column com concrete is uncracked. So because of that reason, always the tendency is to form the uh, the plastic hinge in the beam. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Then we will come to yeah. One more is there. Yeah, one more is and from Umapati. I think uh, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Yes, one body. Yeah. Uh, for the the core wall, if if we confidence about the bracing on all both all direction is firm, can we consider mm. 
as a box section uh, when we uh, calculate the second movement of inertia is a hollow section yes you can you can and in programs like it as you can actually make it happen but when you are doing manual calculations it's not worth trying to do so much extra calculations so why do why you do manual calculations is you want to get quick answers so in quick answers so you can get quick answers by doing simple calculations so don't try to make the calculations very complicated because nobody is going to you know give you more credit these days always keep the calculations simple thank you so if you try to make things complicated you will never be able to construct buildings like altair so there are a lot of complications within the building itself so if you try to if you make your calculations also complicated then it will be impossible so that's why we go with the 3d model with the proper 3d model method, modeling methods program will capture most of this uh, intricate by the program so we don't have really worry about it okay oh, thank you sir yeah sir excuse me Mm, then yeah. each time middle column size is greater than uh, corner column size uh, but when i when i do design sap also and um, doing that way no sir then each column also different size sir. that's what is the opinion i really don't like that because you know when you are doing the construction it, it's so easy to have the same column size for all the columns then then you can easily interchange the shutters Otherwise, you have so many different sets of shutters. It's not worth, uh -huh. right? It's not worth having different column sizes. I would say the same column sizes. Yeah. Sir, but load load this has come different different. Uh, yeah, it doesn't um, matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh -huh. uh, I would rather try to keep the same column size everywhere. Uh -huh. Unless it's absolutely necessary to have different size. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Okay. So with that, shall we conclude? Uh, I think okay. yeah. Sir, can you reduce the column section in top? What is the question? I uh, can you reduce the column section in top floor? Again, again, again. In a ten-story building, I I might not do it. But with a twenty or thirty-story building, certainly yes. Yeah. But in a ten-story building, it's not worth make trying to make the columns uh, too too small because uh, even the smallest column you can have will be only about five hundred by five hundred. Yeah. So so you have to change the shutter and do many things. So I really don't know whether it's worth. That's the same question is in the chat box. I think uh, since you answered the previous question, yeah 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 yeah. You so the same question is there in the chat box. Right right. I think uh, we've done everything. Yes, of course. Yeah, shall shall I call Engineer Sri Malitan to the yes, uh, yeah. uh, You are a word of thanks since it's a marvelous uh, with some difficulties, but we managed to do it. So we'll improve next time. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Engineer Sri Ma. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Trima Vithan, a member of uh, the Knowledge Sharing Subcommittee of Civil Engineering and Sectional Committee, and it is uh, an honor for me to deliver this word of thanks uh, now. Today, the third lecture of medium rise buildings design and construction, explaining the design philosophy for a medium rise building about, of about 10 floors has now completed. A big thank to you, Professor Jaisinga, for your most worthy lesson delivered today. Also, I thank the organizing, organizing subcommittees, the presentation and knowledge sharing of Civil Engineering Sectional Committee for this session. I extend my sincere thanks to the ISL for hosting this and the IT teams for your support. Finally, I thank you all uh, our members who participated in this and I hope you extracted essence of this valuable lecture this evening. Next presentation will be on coming Tuesday for January at 7 p.m. If the time change, so we'll inform you uh, in advance. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Sure. Thank How you. to get that uh, video? Videos uh, will be uploaded to the YouTube, uh, and last two videos also already you can see it from uh, ISL YouTube channel.
this one also will be uploaded very soon ah okay thank you very much sir thank you